07 everybody um today i just want to go over something that i've been meaning to make a video for for a long time and that's just how to get started in sim it's probably the most common question that i ever get asked and uh the biggest answer that i give people is with bombers um now i know a lot of people in the simulation community uh, a lot of the fighter jockeys they really don't like me giving out this advice but frankly that doesn't make it incorrect. Uh, the reason that they don't like me saying this is because they feel that it uh, promotes people to come into sim for the wrong reasons. I feel that it gets people to get into sim um, at all and the chances of a good fighter pilot coming out of that bunch and sticking around because they had a good time is much higher and to me it's about getting people into sim not necessarily what their motivations are for whether they're here to grind or whether they're here to fly and have fun or whether they're here for a dogfight or whether they're here to spade out aircraft that makes me know never mind i just want you guys to have a good time now step one in having a good time in sim is to make sure that you're actually being productive and turning a profit so if you want to jump into sim and you want to grab something like an f4u corsair and just just go head first into the very first dogfight you find nothing is going to stop you from doing that but you probably will not do well you will probably not be profitable and once you see those negative rewards once you see that loss of sl you are very unlikely to return. Not only did you not have a good time, but you actively worked at a detriment to your account's progress. So I'm here to try to mitigate a lot of that damage that people face. Uh, a lot of people come into me uh, with questions about how to get into sim, and they're like, you know, I wanna, I wanna fly the BF-109 in sim. I'm like, step one, don't fly the BF-109 in sim. And they go, what? Why? And I'm like, dude, just start with bombers. Look, you're gonna have enough stuff on your plate that trying to ride a bucking single engine fighter with limited visibility and limited potential to you know do well is just not conducive to your learning experience right now so let's just start with the basics and start with the bombers now bombers actually win games in sim as much as the fighters might not like to hear it having 10 kills and zero deaths does not really help the team uh, not nearly as much as having 10 deaths and 10 tons of bombs dropped. That's what actually moves the progress bar. That's what actually completes the objectives. And a brand new day one simulation pilot literally just set up my controls five minutes ago can be the most influential person on the team due strictly to that fact in and of itself. Now, there's a whole medley of aircraft that are viable to do this with. I'm going to be demonstrating the B-26 bomber today because it is probably the best of the bunch. So when people ask me, hey, like, where do I start? I always tell them EC-3, either EC-2 or EC-3, but EC-3 is probably the best place to start. It has the most balance. It has the most engaging uh, gameplay. It has, you know, uh, the most full lobbies and population. And uh, typically it has some of the most, uh, you know, rewards that can be, you know, applied all the way pretty far down the tree with, with like minimal loss. EC-3 is like the golden age of dogfighting in sim and it just has some of the best aircraft. The B-26 is just extremely fast, it's extremely tough, it's very easy to fly, it has great ordnance, great defensive firepower, um, it's uh, able to, you know... It's, it's able to maneuver, it's agile enough that it can, you know, it's not just a donkey and in the, in the, like if you, if you got somebody on your tail, you can actually shake and bake just a little bit. And it's got forward firing armament with a good optic to be able to fire with. So it's a good jack of all trades, master of none. Let's go ahead and get started. First things first, if you're getting into sim, a lot of people, I see them do this. They'll, they'll pick their plane as if they're playing arcade or realistic. And they'll they'll have their lineup built like like so, and they'll just go simulator battles. They'll go air simulator battles, and they'll hit take part. This is not the way you want to do it ever. Uh, you always want to open up the room list. Just manually open that up. You can click only available if you want. That'll make it. That'll condense the list down. Uh, I like to collapse these everyone versus everyone categories because those games typically are the most stupid and least balanced. 
And uh, even though they allow you to play countries that you otherwise wouldn't be able to, like Israel and Sweden and whatnot, uh, typically they are very imbalanced and one-sided. Uh, these types of games right here with uh, historical matchups tend to operate a lot better uh, uh, and are a lot easier to not only identify enemies but to stand a chance at winning. Both teams uh, tend to have very equal powers. So we're going to pick this EC3 Ruhr right here. Now you see the three, the Ruhr, and Enduring Confrontation, right? We could see how many players are on each side. We can open up the player list. If you're ever trying to find the room that I'm in, you know, just ask me what map I'm on, what EC I'm in. Find that, click on it, hit the players, and then see if you can find my name in this list. And that's how you can tell where I'm at. You guys are always free to join my lobbies. You don't need to ask. I enjoy the heck out of it. Uh, sharing the skies with you guys is one of the best privileges of streaming, to be quite honest with you. EC3 Maginot Line just started. We'll go ahead and uh, to battle on this. Now, once you get into the match here, you'll see that there are several airports to choose from. It's the basic spawn menu that you're used to in other games, in other game modes, uh, where you can select all of your different aircraft. Once you've selected your aircraft, you can select your ordnance, uh, the tracer package, everything like that. Make sure you check uh, these these fuel amounts. If you're flying a bomber, you almost always just need minimum fuel. You know, you got two and a half hours of fuel here. That's how long the game lasts for. You'll definitely be heading home and out of bombs before two and a half hours hit. So there's no sense in, you know, being like three or four or five times as heavy as you need to be when you can just bring in 47 minutes and that'll do fine. Bomb activation timer, I recommend no lower than two seconds. If you're doing low level bombing and you're in this range, you're just asking to blow your own tail off. Three seconds is even probably a little bit more conducive until you get some experience. And the other thing is here is the respawn base. Now you'll see that there's five airfields and we can see them here on the map. Now one thing to point out is even though these all have different airfield numbers associated with them, there's no real rhyme or reason to their naming scheme. For example, airfield one is here, airfield two is down here, airfield three is up there, and so on and so forth, right? So when you're describing these airfields, don't call them by their airfield number because anybody who's not actively in the spawn menu with you has no idea what you're talking about because they probably didn't memorize it beforehand. So if you have a friend that's out here that's RTB and he's like, hey, where are you going to spawn? Don't tell him you're spawning at airfield 1 because that doesn't make any sense to him. Tell him it's Charlie 1. Give him the grid square. So this is Alpha 2, this is Charlie 1, this is Delta 2, this is Foxtrot 2, and this is Hotel 1, right? Now... Not only do we have all of our different airports, but we also have all of our different objectives. So this is the enemy side of the map. You can see the enemy side and friendly side are delineated by this uh, blue and red line. And this line will move throughout the enduring confrontation as territory is gained and lost. And this is how territory is gained and lost. This is the axis pushing into this grid square trying to take it over. And they will carve out a notch into our territory. Uh, we want to try to defend that, but for our purposes today, this is what we're after. For a new player that's just getting started out, these little mini bases right here are what you want to do. Every team is going to have some mini bases. Once these things are destroyed, they'll be dead for about five minutes or so, and then they'll just respawn somewhere else at random. Your team is going to have some blue shields. Those are your mini bases, and these red targets are the enemy mini bases. So let's find a airfield that's close to a couple of these mini bases. And, you know, Foxtrot 2 or Delta 2 seem like good candidates, so we could just left-click on that and make sure that it's, like, circled uh, or squared off with this uh, yellow yellow rectangle here to let you know that you've got it selected. And I'm going to choose Delta 2 so we can go north of this ground battle. Instead of flying through this ground battle, this is a very likely place where enemies are going to be. And I don't really want to see enemy fighters. So if I can just, you know, circumnavigate them and go around, that's going to, you know, be better for my mission. And we'll head towards this target up here to kind of keep even further away. So we'll take off and we'll just kind of head on maybe about a, a 0.75 to a 0.80 heading and get there. So we got our bomb selected, our fuel, our airfield, our mission, and we're going to go ahead and hit to battle. Now if you notice when you hit to battle, it says 5,575 silver lions. You are paying the repair cost of the aircraft to spawn. And that's very important to keep in mind when you're choosing what planes to fly. If you're choosing something that costs a lot to fly and you're still learning how to take off and you're crashing over and over again or you're, you know, facing a really powerful enemy and you're flying a 20,000 Silver Lion plane, you're going to go broke really quick. If you can find an aircraft that costs almost nothing to spawn and you're able to be very productive within, 
then you know you stand a much higher chance of uh, actually earning some good silver lines. Now what you want to do is just make sure all your controls are set and everything like that. You got both your engines on. Not only do you have your, both your engines on, but you're in a multi-engine aircraft. Make sure that your RPMs and your manifold pressure are both online and steady before you throttle up. Oftentimes, you'll see players will, you know, hit the engine ignition button and then just go ahead and jam the throttle forward. But sometimes the engines start asymmetrically, so you'll have like the left engine start and then you'll have the right engine start. So you want to try to wait until both engines are fully online so that way you're not getting a huge boost of power on one side of the aircraft that's going to twist you all around. Once we've got all that taken care of, we'll go ahead and throttle up full war emergency power, put our flaps into takeoff, and just use a little bit of rudder here in order to keep the runway center line. Now if you need to supplement that with some differential braking, that's something that you can actually do in the sim that you can't do in some of the other modes. You can set up controls for a right brake, and controls for a left brake. Right brake, left brake. And that'll really help you steer on the runway. Get to about 100 knots, 110 knots, and rotate back smoothly. Positive rate of climb, gears coming up. When I say positive rate of climb, you're watching this climb in decent meter to make sure that you're actually disconnecting from the ground. Flaps are being raised. We're gonna double check the gear is up by putting the gear down and back up one more time. And we're gonna double check that the flaps are fully raised. Once you've uh, successfully departed, you can then go ahead and start checking the map and finding your on-course heading. So we're going to be at about an 80 heading, right? So let's go ahead and turn left and achieve probably more like a 075 heading. And we're looking up here in the corner. And there's about a 075 heading right there. I'm just using my WASD keyboards here. And from here we can go ahead and start trimming the aircraft out so if you notice that I've got to put my mouse way up in the top right corner there in order to keep the plane level not only do I have to do that but also my little black ball right here my side slip indicator is not centered up so let's start with that first we're gonna dial in some rudder so some rudder trim is coming online you see that black ball is becoming centered up now and that's gonna help give us some right roll which means that we can take out some of that mouse input we're gonna center up our mouse now you can see we're still rolling slightly off to the left, maybe one more tick of rudder trim to center that ball up. We'll level out the plane artificially, we'll kind of watch it, and it looks like we're rolling ever so slightly off to the left, so maybe one notch of right aileron trim looks pretty good. Now we can return our ball to the center, and we can watch our rate of climb here. So we've been climbing, now let's go ahead and reduce that engine power for this stage watch those thermals. I like to cruise on about 90% power. I think pretty much every engine in the game can handle 90% power even if it's not spaded. So 90% is just a good cruise climb. Just just a good cruising throttle. Alright, so with our all of our controls neutral, we've got our side slip on zero. We got about a 700 foot per minute climb rate. And we are neither rolling left or right. Now we just need to correct our heading one more time. So we're going to turn right to about a heading of 085. And we're just going to use the keyboard for this. We're just going to be tilting our plane off to the right by kind of tapping the D key until we achieve a heading of 085. And then we'll let go of the keyboard and the plane will automatically level itself up. This is just standard mouse and keyboard flying. So don't let people tell you you can't fly mouse and keyboard in sim. And there's about a 085 there. We'll roll out level check our map one more time and look we are oh, sorry disregard that we are on course to our heading here now that we're on course to our heading we'll go ahead and switch to our gunner view and begin looking around now there are only first person views in sim unless you're in a bomber this is one of the big reasons I recommend new players fly bombers because you're probably not going to be accustomed to being trapped in the cockpit the whole time and this can be very difficult to scout around and, and, and watch for threats and whatnot, but you have a completely unrestricted view here. Now, is it cheesy? Yes. Yeah. Should it be removed from the game? Absolutely. But while it's in the game, and so long as it's in the game, and I see it not being removed from the game anytime soon or probably ever, you might as well use it. So we can just go ahead and scan all around, and we can look for threats. And if we see anything interesting, like that guy way up there, that looks like an enemy scout plane, if I had to guess. Maybe even a P-38. That guy way out there, that looks like a BF-109, I'd say. 
Now that BF-109, that's likely an enemy, if it's a BF-109, I'm just guessing. So we're going to estimate, so we can see he's about at our 10 to 11 o'clock position relative to our aircraft. So we're going to kind of estimate some distance, draw a line on the map where we think that probably is, and then left click Attention here. That indicates to our team that we see a bogey out there. We neither know if it, uh, we, we don't know if it's either friend or foe. We just see it and we're worried about it. So those are bombers going overhead. Those are enemy bombers right there. BF-110s it looks like. And now with the bombers, they've got two fighters up with them. And those fighters are going to see me and they're going to dive down on me. And here they come, I think. Yep, they're rolling in on me now. So we're going to go ahead and pitch downward. Start losing a little bit of altitude. We're going to increase to war emergency power. We're going to check our map one more time for a heading to target. Our target is off to the right a little bit. Let's make some heading corrections now. That's our target right there. Roger that. You can see it's down here at our 1 o'clock low, just like that thing is. Let's look for those fighters. Okay, we broke contact with the fighters because we got far enough away from their bombers. So let's go ahead and open up our bomb bay doors. Make our corrections to the target now and switch to our bomber view you can see the target right here we'll go ahead and get ready to drop our bomb load now i'm not sure how many bombs it takes to kill let's try just six for now i think six will do it and that, that that gives us two bombs left There go our bombs hitting the hitting the base. One bomb went a little long. And that mini base is completely destroyed. So we've got two bombs left that we can use. We'll go ahead and come out of war emergency power, watching the thermals on the engine. One thing to keep in mind in sim, there is no hand holding with your thermals. It's not like arcade. Let's close up our bomb bay door so we can go a little faster. It's not like arcade where you can just leave your plane and WEP and the plane will automatically go back and forth between WEP and not in order to, you know, ensure that you're not overheating your engine. Another thing to look out for is, you see this airfield here that I've just discovered. That's an enemy airfield. We didn't see it on the map before. You have to fly kind of close to it in order to see it. Those things will absolutely mess you up with flak. So you want to avoid those at all costs. If you ever see an airfield that kind of surprises you like that, turn away from it with haste. Now there's the other factory right there. You can look, we got a factory tucked in between the confluence of two rivers here. So right in between those two rivers, here's our two rivers coming together, right? Here's the confluence. I'm sorry. And right there, tucked into the confluence, is our little mini base. So I'm not, you know, I'm not magic. I've been doing this for a while, and I know you, you probably were like, how in the heck is he even seeing these things? Like, how does that look any different than, you know, say, I don't know, that? You know, what, what's what's the difference here, right? So I've just been doing this for a while. I kind of have seen most of the mini bases and what they look like. And I'm just looking at, you know, I'm doing dead reckoning and pilotage in order to associate these things with, like, certain landmark features. So we'll fly right over here. And we're, the trick with the bomb site is little corrections early. So you see my little mouse moving down there, right? And we're just kind of drifting that site to stay right on course. We've got two bombs. Let's open up that bomb bay door and drop one bomb and two bombs. Bam! Alright, both bombs are away. We're gonna get a good bit of tonnage. Now let's go ahead and at this point now we have effectively secured our research points and our silver lions. Now we can actually go get into some trouble. So a lot of people are like, well, Dragon, you know, this seems like a good way to like you know, get into the game of sim and start contributing to my team and, you know, helping them win and everything like that, but, uh, I'm gonna get bored of it pretty quick. Now, I don't say that you should, oh, looks like it only takes maybe three of those bombs to destroy a base. I mean, we'll have to test that out. So at this point, once you're RTB, once you've dropped your bombs, you have been, quote-unquote, productive. You have served your life. You've, you know, served your purpose. We are almost number one on the leaderboard. We dropped 0.824 tonnage. Looks like we could have dropped more, but we'll remember that for next time. But now, look, we've got um, 
Some of, we got surveillance at Charlie 3 we can go after. We've got bombers at Echo 3 we can go after. Let's go hit those bombers. So that this is why I love recommending the B-25, the B-26, the BF-110. All these, you know, more obscure... Uh, you know, kind of frontline fast bombers because they typically have forward armament associated with them that you can use to do things other than bombing. Not only are they fast, not only are they tough, you know, like like agile opponents that can be tough to, to kill from a fighter's perspective, but still relatively protected with their gunners, but you can take these things into a dogfight. You could take these things into a furball. I've got like, what, five, maybe even six fifty caliber weapons uh, looks like times five 50 caliber weapons with 1,100 rounds of ammunition. That's a lot of pew. So, let's see, we've got destroy bombers at E3. Echo 3 is right here, right in front of it. And you can see, bam, one, two, three, four, five, six bombers. The two associated fighters are back here, you know, entrapped in a nice little furball with my friendly team. So I'm, f these guys are coming right at me. I'm free to intercept these guys. Now, not only can I use my forward-firing armament to take them out, but I basically have, like, Shrig music cannons on this thing. So I can get underneath that bomber formation and use my gunners to fire up into it. Or I can get inside the formation and literally my side blister guns and my tail guns will just sit there and, like, while you're shooting the guy down in front of you, your side gunners are shooting down the guys next to you and behind you. So we're going to go ahead and set a little intercept course. We got some Dorniers here that we're going to hit. I thought they were BF-110s earlier, but they're Dornier 217s. We're going to go ahead and lead our target and open up. Watch pull power. We're just going to roll in. Roll in. What I'm going to do is get park myself underneath these guys and then match pace with them, right? So I'm just going to get right here, park right underneath them. And you hear that? That's my top turret gunner doing my doing my job for me. And you can just sit here and fly. Now I'm, I'm gonna take over and do and do a better job than him. Bam! That is all six bombers destroyed. No problem. We're perfectly healthy. We dropped a bunch of bombs. Now we're in first place. And you can see the huge chunk out of the enemy. That's us. We did that. And now that we've shot some people down, actually it looks like we got a little furball right up here. Maybe maybe we go get into some trouble, but you know what? Let's just know when to hold them, know when to fold them. Let's go ahead and head on back home. So we just did a lot of shooting. We just fired a lot of tracers. We definitely caused a lot of trouble. You definitely want to be on the lookout. You know, and I know there's a lot of parachutes out there, but we're looking among them to see if there, any of those are fast-moving BF-109s, making sure that nobody's diving on us, making sure that nobody's intercepting us. Go ahead and set a course for home. Doesn't matter where you land. You can't, like, I'm going to land where I took off from, but that doesn't matter. You can, you can land at any available friendly airfield. But one thing to make sure of is that you're actually landing at an active airfield. Sometimes you'll see an airfield like right here. You know, you'll just see like what appears to be a runway on the ground and it looks just like an airfield. I mean, it's got runways. Sometimes it'll even have buildings on it. That does not mean it's an airfield. Sometimes those are just, you know, intrinsic parts of the map. Like that is a map asset. That is not a an active area so if you land on it it's no better than landing out in the middle of a field like that like the game cannot tell that you're at an airport uh so it has to be a friendly airport and it has to be an operational airport so one thing to keep in mind is you see these little four green marks those are the health bars of the four modules on the airfield the four modules are the runway module one the residential area module two the hangars module three and the fuel module four Right, so the fuel, uh, the fuel is pretty self-explanatory. If the fuel module is damaged and you need fuel, it will take longer to refuel your aircraft, and it may not even refuel you at all. If the fuel is completely destroyed, you cannot get fuel at that airport. The hangars, they handle the repair and rearmament of the aircraft. So if you need more bullets or you need a hole patched up in your wing, then you need the hangars. The more damage you have, 
the longer it's going to take, but if the hangers are damaged, they will take a lot longer, sometimes up to 10, 15, 20 minutes, right? Or if the hangers are completely destroyed, then it will not repair you at all. So keep that in mind. If you see yellow, red, and black bars there, it's really important to try to figure out which module is destroyed. And you can typically tell that pretty easily, because as you approach the airfield, you'll be able to tell, like, the hangers have been... You know, if there's, like, one black bar, you'll be able to see the hangers are, like, completely flattened and the fuel looks fine. So you can tell that, okay, well, I can land here because I don't actually need repairs, I just need more fuel. But if you got an engine out and you try to land there, it'll never fix the engine. So it is important to kind of keep that in mind when choosing an RTB base. Um, however, all of my bases are at full health, and we're just going to line ourselves up with the runway, right? Just go ahead and like, put that runway right in front of us. And boom, there it is right there. Go ahead and start slowing down nice and early. Now, when you slow down, I recommend checking behind you, making sure nobody follows you to the airfield. I also recommend, this is something that I do, I put on my smoke. When I'm coming in for a landing, this is how I signal to, like, friendly people on the airfield that I'm not coming in for a strafing run. I'm coming in to land. I'm a, I'm a friendly. Like, if I, if I was an enemy, I wouldn't be pronouncing my uh, announcing my position like this. Get your flaps down, get your gear down. Double, even if you think you lowered your gear, when you get to this point in the landing, go ahead and bring your gear up and back down again, just to make sure that it's actually down. Flaps and gear are down. Now, as those flaps come fully down, you may want to add more power. Just add a little bit more power. Help control that sink rate. And as you cross the runway threshold, pull back on the stick nice and easy and go to idle power and just hold that stick back. Hold that stick back. Use your rudder to maintain center line. Ease onto your mains. Let that nose wheel drop nice and gingerly. Bam. And then slowly apply your brakes. Keeping firm back pressure. My elevator is fully up. And another thing I like to do, just for funsies, you don't have to do this. I like to taxi off the runway. I just think it's... Uh, I, I, I wish there was something in the game that made this worthwhile. There's not. It's just fun. I like to taxi over to the hangars and just, you know, go put my plane in parking. You could be a nerd like me if you want, or you could just stay on the runway. It really makes no difference. Uh, some people do this strategically when there are airfield strafers. They'll hide between the hangars, which is a very worthwhile strategy, because that really can help kind of shield you from incoming rockets and, uh, and, and machine gun rounds. But I like to just pull it to the hangars like this and, and just kind of put my plane in parking because I'm weird. Uh, so sometimes you'll see me do this if I land with a perfectly healthy plane. It's almost like my little victory lap. And then once you get to the hangars, just make a little complete stop here. We can shut down our engines. We can raise up our flaps. And bam, we are, we are ready to get repaired and rearmed. Now once we get repaired and rearmed, It'll respawn us on the airfield. Now, if we want to fly this plane again, we could just take back off. And we're, we're perfectly capable of just taking off and doing it again. But if you are like, okay, you know, hey, I had my bomber fun. I'm ready to go. Just go ahead and bounce out. Or if you want to change planes, you can just J out. Once you've repaired and rearmed, J out. Your plane is saved at this airfield. If you notice, if I were to spawn my B-26 right now, it doesn't cost, well, it cost me 420. I think that's the cost it took me to repair, like, the little bit of damage and the rearmament that I had to do. But it's effectively free. It's like 5,000 Silver Lions cheaper. But at this point, I can spawn, say, my P-47, which once you've... Actually, let's bring in an attacker. That'll be better for the, for the lesson, I think. Uh, now let's, let's bring in a P-47. Th that'll work. So once you've kind of gotten the hang of flying the bombers, I recommend going into attackers. So the bombers go after these mini bases, right? Now you want to try to, like, you know, start branching out and maybe doing something a little bit more advanced, right? Then I recommend going after these little ground battles right here, or these convoys. It's a much more complex objective, but still tackleable. So... What we're going to do is we're going to bring in a P-47 loaded to bear. Now, this is one of my biggest recommendations for people that are playing Sim. If your fighter aircraft has the option to bring in ordnance, bring it in. The bombs, the rockets cost almost nothing, and you can be amazingly effective with them. Let's get our takeoff flaps in place. If you 
take off with bombs and rockets and you t depart with the purpose of using those bombs and rockets even if you don't ultimately do it but you're going for it every time you know nine out, nine out of ten times you'll be successful go ahead and get a little rotate here positive rate of climb again positive rate of climb gear up flaps coming up now don't remove all your flaps all at once I've got steady back pressure on the stick there watching my speed my speeds going back up go ahead and raise that flap up one more time and you notice when those flaps come up that nose drops you may not be used to that in arcade and realistic battles you know because your plane is constantly compensating uh, with you know with the mouse aim flying but in sim you're doing everything so if you just if you just remove those flaps all in one fell swoop and you're not going fast enough you'll go from flying to dying like that so uh, taking bombs it will make you heavier it will make you slower but if you take off with bombs and rockets and you go and you use them it's the same premise as with the bombers one not only are you massively helping your team to win the match by dumping extra tonnage on mini bases and killing tanks and howitzers and pillboxes but it's like guaranteed easy experience so if you're a brand new sim pilot and you take off and you're looking for a fight and you go into a dogfight you're probably going to lose and I'm not talking trash it's just a fact of life like if you're brand new to sim and you're going up against somebody who has a thousand hours they're almost assuredly going to defeat you unless you get extraordinarily lucky but if you take off and you drop bombs and rockets on on a target on a defenseless non-movable object and then you go get into a dogfight even if you lose the dogfight one you got to have your fun you got to learn your lessons you got to gain your experience but two you don't go home with a big fat goose egg you still dropped your bombs and your rockets and you still got a lot of good you know headway in the in terms of progress uh, that, that you can that you can be proud of and you helped move the bar up here if every single person on your team flew with that like you know m mantra and always brought their bombs around. your team would never never lose it's incredibly overpowered uh, killing these little mini bases is way more valuable than like shooting down a fighter but a lot of people are playing sim and they just you know they're just here for the dog fights and that's okay too but you can get your dog fights in and still drop your bombs now a lot of people like if you're in a BF 109 you're like ah well it's only a 250 kilogram bomb like you know that's not really gonna make a big difference yes it does over the course of time now your one bomb dropped one time is not gonna destroy a base but if you're always taking off and you're bringing that one bomb and you're going in and you're dropping it or everybody else in your team is doing it it's like death by a thousand pinpricks right hold on we got a little contact right up here a little 10 o'clock high I'm kinda interested in that's that's a high threat for me so you notice I'm kinda staying low I'm trying to terrain mask just a little bit I was heading towards that like uh, that ground battle area but that ground battle area is gone now I'm going around the A point there's a big old fur ball going on in that A point if you ever want to find the dog fights that's where the dog fights are now we are gonna be going there eventually but first first things first gotta get rid of these bombs and rockets now you might be asking yourself okay I brought bombs and rockets but now there's an enemy fighter on my tail. What do I do? Get rid of them. Dump the bombs, dump the rockets, go into dogfighting mode. You know what I mean? Like, you take off and you go towards a ground objective for as long as you are not discovered by the enemies. As soon as the enemies discover you and you see somebody diving on you, get rid of the extra weight and fight. Now, that may seem wasteful, but again, those bombs and rockets cost you next to nothing. I mean, they were basically free. I think the bombs, yeah. All these bombs and rockets that I'm bringing right now cost 630 silver lions. That's nothing. You're going to make that back in no time at all. So just get rid of the extra weight and go into dogfighting mode. But if you're able to slip past everybody unnoticed, congratulations. Now you get a free crap ton of experience. So you see here, we dropped two 600 pound bombs on this base earlier. What we're going to do is we're going to come in here and try to finish it off the rockets and the bombs will work here now I believe my two 1,000 pound bombs drop first however I don't want to do that so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into weapon selection mode and we're gonna select our 500 pound bomb uh, secondary fire secondary weapons That'll do. 
So we're going to drop our 500 pound bomb instead of our two 1000s, because our two 1000s is going to be overkill. We may even use our rockets here. We'll see if the 500 pound bomb will do the trick. Here's the destroyed remnants of what's left. And this is why we want to have a nice two or three second, uh, we're going to go into war emergency power. Bam. Drop our 500 pound bomb away, pull up and away. Bomb goes off. That mini base is de- Hold on. Almost destroyed. Almost destroyed. So now we're going to turn our weapon selection mode off. And instead of using those two 1,000 pound bombs, I'm just going to use my rockets here. There's only a tiny sliver. There's only a tiny, tiny sliver of mini base left here. So we're just going to come in here and... Boop, 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 boop. Bam. Base is gone. And we still got two 1,000 pound bombs. Now what can we do with those? Well, we got a ground objective that just popped up. So we're just constantly reevaluating the map, we're constantly reading the map, we're constantly reading the mission objectives, and we're constantly evaluating where we are with fuel, munitions, and health. A good way to, especially when you start working with other wingmen, is to just categorize those things in like color codes. So you got green, yellow, red, right? If you are full fuel, full ammunition, full bombs, you're, you're good to go, you are green and green. You're green, green ammo, green fuel. If you're getting a little low on fuel, but you still got plenty of ammunition, your green ammunition, your yellow fuel. If you're getting to the point where it's like, hey, your your teammate calls for cover, you're like, all right, I'm coming, but I'm I'm red and red. I've got very little ammunition left, and I've got very little fuel left. So I'm gonna come and try to help you, but I'm not sure how much help I'm going to be. Now, when you get to a point where you are out of ammunition, that is known as Winchester. When you are out of fuel. That is known as bingo. So if you tell your friends, if they say, hey, I, I, need, I need help over here, you go, bingo. They automatically knows, know what that means. Okay, he's bingo, he's not coming. And if he does come out here, he's going to die for it. You know what I mean? Like, basically, bingo fuel is I have just enough fuel to get me home and no more. I cannot dick around at all with the amount of fuel that I have left. Winchester is I'm excruciatingly low or completely out of ammunition and by excruciatingly low I mean you don't have enough ammunition to even take you through one engagement like maybe you've got like 47 machine gun rounds left and like three cannon rounds like maybe if you get a lucky shot that's enough to take out somebody but it's not worth like if you have the option at that point to go home or get into a fight you should choose to go home because you're you know kind of going into a fight with one hand tied behind your back now we're reevaluating the situation up here we got one, two, three aircraft overhead. They look like friendlies. That's a friendly P-51. That's a friendly Yak. And we've got the enemy tanks down here. So one thing to do with these, so you see I'm coming in from the northeast. I'm actually going to turn off to the north, and I'm going to do a run. From I'm going to kind of do a, a big U-turn back around here, a hard left U-turn. And I'm going to do a run from north to south and that's going to line up the tanks so that their side face onto me their movement will be perpendicular to me and I'll have many targets in front of me so instead of ha like uh, honing in on one of them I can look and see if there's any of them that are next to each other there's not I can so I got all ki all kinds of pumas here but I don't want to drop my 1000 pound bombs on a puma it's kind of a waste of bombs that Panzer IV right there prime throttle up bombs away pulling up Good kill, Panzer IV down. Now, just because I dropped my bombs doesn't mean that I'm done here. There's lightly armored vehicles down there. There's Pumas. My 50 cows will rip right through those Pumas. And this is why you want to do north and south runs. Because when you get those side face Puma targets, that now you're firing out a billboard instead of a, a pencil. Now you got a nice wide fat target in front of you. You're going to line them up in your sights and let it loose. Now the only reason you really want to do this is if you have air dominance. If you don't have... Now I have like three friendly fighters in this vicinity here. If I didn't have those guys, you know, I might be a little bit more cautious about this. But because I have so much friendly firepower with me, I'm going to go ahead and go for it. Now what I'm doing back here is, is what's known as like a, like a teardrop maneuver. And if you ever trace that out on the map, it kind of makes the shape of a little teardrop. I did a north to south run. Now I want to do a south to north run. Well, if I just turn right around... 
I won't be going south to north. I'll be kind of coming in from the southeast or the or the southwest. So what I want to do is, hold on, I'm doing a north to south. So I'd be coming in from the northeast to the northwest. In order to come in from the due north like I want to, I have to turn like 30 or 40 degrees one direction and then all the way around the opposite direction. So you make a, you draw like a little teardrop on the map. And that way you can come in on the reciprocal heading that you originally egressed on. Oh, got a little too close to the ground? That's all right. We'll just go ahead and get our gear down. Find a nice little field to land in. Control our speed using our flaps here. Flaps are up. Flaps coming back down. Steady back pressure. Steady back pressure. And then just settle down. Settle down. Easy on the brakes. Use the brakes to control that uneven terrain. A little bit more on the right brake than the left brake while we're going uphill. And bam. Nice little crash landing. Save a little bit of money. And bam. That's it. Still in first place. Putting up really good scores here. And, uh... Yeah. We're ready to keep playing. We're winning the game by... Completing these objectives. By doing that damage. Anyway, guys. That is... Sim in a nutshell. And... Don't feel like you have to do all that, like, right away on day one. You know, strafing pumas is not easy. As you just saw, I've been doing it for a long time, and I just messed it up. So, you know, it, it's it's not like um, it's not like it's the easiest thing in the world. One more thing I want to show you, actually, that sound just prompted me. You may leave the game like I just did, and you may be like, what? 76 RP, 25,000 Silver Lions, that was terrible. What the heck? You know, I thought Sim had good rewards. It does. These are not your rewards. This is like your preliminary, like, between lives report. So you can see what you did here, but you're not getting full credit for any of this yet. These are like, um, I think these are like raw, uh, bonuses or something like that. I'm not quite sure exactly like what this screen is trying to tell you, but these are not your actual results. Because you left the game early, the game does not know how much to properly give you. So they are reserving that experience and they're holding that experience, you know, kind of in escrow until the game decides if your team won or lost and to decide how to apply all your bonuses and everything like that. So if you go out there and you play for 15 minutes and you leave, it may show you a crappy result screen like that, but then, you know, when you come to log in the next day, you'll notice that you have 150,000 more SL and you, like, you, you log into the game and they're like, oh, congratulations, here's three modules you unlocked. And you're like, I just logged in. How did I unlock these? That's how, because the game, you know, it decided your team won the match and then it gave you 110,000 RP while you were offline. And when you logged in, the game goes, here's your 110,000 RP. By the way, you got, you know, fire extinguishers and all this different stuff unlocked. And you're like, okay, cool, cool, cool. So, guys, that's them in a nutshell. Um, it's extremely approachable. You don't need a joystick to do it. You can fly mouse and keyboard. You don't have to be a dogfighting ace. You don't have to know about engine mixtures and manual engine control. You don't have to know about advanced dogfighting maneuvers or anything like that. You can just come into sim and fly pretty casually. And not only can you do that, but you can be one of the best people on your team without ever actually seeing the enemy. I was in first place, never saw an enemy fighter. Not once. And I was the most influential person on the team. I was the reason the team was winning just now. Like, we were winning by twice as many points. And that was due to what you guys just saw me do. All I did was drop a couple of bombs, fire a couple of rockets, and, you know, destroy a couple of pumas on the ground. No big deal. Um, so, don't be intimidated by Sim. Um, if you, if you want to get into it, don't feel like, you know, you have to be some kind of BF-109 fighter ace in order to, like, even approach the sim come in here come grab a bomber and uh treat it as a crawl walk jog 
sprint. That's how I always kind of, you know, approach it. I'm like, hey, when you first get into sim, you're crawling. And you're going to crawl with a bomber. You're going to go and you're going to go after big, stationary, defenseless objects that are worth good points, that are very easy to tackle, that are not well defended. And that's crawling, right? Now, okay, when you kind of get the hang of that and you're doing that pretty successfully and you kind of like, okay, I'm ready for a little bit more, now you're ready to walk. And you walk with an attacker. So, okay, you're not fully out of the bomber category. You know, you still got some defensive gunners. You still got multi-engine platforms. You're still going after relatively defenseless objects. But maybe now those objects that are relatively defenseless are moving. Maybe now they're tanks. You know, maybe but they're not very, very well protected tanks. But they're smaller and they're moving. So they're a little harder to hit. Uh, you have, you don't have a bomb site anymore. So you're kind of like glide bombing in and stuff like that, right? So you're kind of... Uh, but you can also start to, as you master that, now you can start to jog. So now you're in a BF-110 or you're, you know, you're, you're in a PBJ-1H or some other type of attacker. And you can start using that forward firing uh, munitions to start jogging and start going after the bombers and the attackers and the surveillance aircraft and maybe even a fighter or two. Um, and you start jogging with that. And then when you're ready to sprint and you're like, okay, I feel like I've got the hang of this. I'm taking off. I'm landing. I'm doing the objectives. I'm like getting put good points in the leaderboard here. I'm ready to sprint. Go hop in a single engine fighter. You know, make sure to bring the bomb. Make sure to bring your rockets. Make sure to try to use them if you want to win the game. And uh, and go have at it. Go go head first right into a furball. And that's sprinting. And now and now you're playing sim. And for some people, that journey is a couple of weeks long. For some people, that journey is a, you know, a couple of months long. For some people, it's a couple of years long. Um, keep messing with your setting. Keep asking good questions. Keep looking for communities. Of course, you guys can always join mine. It's the largest simulation War Thunder Discord community in existence that I'm aware of by a large margin. Um, pretty much all the sim pilots are on there. We're always like kind of trying to group up and fly together and fill up matches, friends and foes. Um, so that's just a really good people uh, place to come and meet people and and do events and you know find people to fly with and, and find big lobbies of people that are actually talking to one another. So make sure you hop into a Discord community and just ask questions. Be like, hey guys, I'm having trouble with this. What do you think? Or hey, like you know my my plane's acting kind of funny when I try to do this thing. Am I doing something wrong? And you will be bombarded with heartfelt and you know uh, worthwhile explanations. Uh, tutorials, uh, helpful screenshots, and you know, paragraphs of information being like, hey, yeah, I've been in your shoes before, here's what's going on, here's what you need to do, you need to go in the control menu, you need to change this to this, and this to this, and this to this, and uh, and, and we just want to get you flying, and we just want you to have a good time. So come see us over on the Discord, and I hope this video was helpful. I know it was a little long-winded, I've been meaning to make a video like this for a long time, because again, most common question I ever get asked. Anyway, until next time, fly safe, good hunting. 07.